Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Talks. Today we have our lovely guest, Ni, nee, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Ni, nee. I'm an ENTJ, um, and my wife and I live in Denver, Colorado. Thanks for having Excellent. me. Excellent. And so Ni nee used to work for Personality Hacker, and he is one cool ENTJ. Yeah. What are some ways you've grown your TE over these years? What activities have proven most useful for growing your TE? Doing projects. Um, so I would say since college, I've had, I'm constantly doing projects. Um, one, I think projects are a great way to learn. I think it's the best way to learn. We typically think about learning as a passive activity where it's like, I'm just going to observe and listen or, or read and think about in that concept. But true learning leads to behavior change. And so I find that projects are a really great way to test uh, ideas in the real world and get real world feedback and, 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 and collaborate with other people. So I found that projects has been a really great way to, to develop TE. And then also what I found, uh, so yeah, I would say for several years, I just would have a lot of different projects. So for example, when I was in college, um, my friends and I had this idea of, um, we were architecture majors and we would use our cameras a lot uh, to take pic uh, pictures for our architecture class. And then we had a couple of friends say, hey, could you take some photos of us for our, our, our profile? This was when like Facebook and social media was starting to like, you know, get more traction. And so we looked at each other and thought, well, why don't we just start a little business taking pictures? Um, and, and so like that was a project. Um, so some of them ended up doing okay, others were a total flop, but it was a really great way, doing projects was a really great way to develop TE and then I would say the big hack was doing projects with people who were much uh, more sophisticated than I was uh, and who had a lot more experience executing things. I found that partnering with people like that to do projects was a way to accelerate and grow TE. Because if it was just me, right, or, or somebody that uh, just wasn't as strong at completing projects, we both ended up having like um, projects that weren't really done at the end of the day. And we were just like spinning our wheels and going around. But if I partner with somebody who had a lot more experience, um, the whole way through, it was basically just like a growth project. Um, so I would say like that's probably been the number one thing to uh, to develop TE. And so like oh, another co concrete example is uh, probably about five or six years ago, one of my friends and I had this idea of developing an app to help parents get their kids ready for college. And so we started talking to parents. Uh, we came up with some mock-ups and we started designing the app. But along the way, we discovered from talking to parents that um, this app or tool we were creating wasn't actually what they were looking for. What they really cared about was money. How do I pay for my kids' college education and help them win scholarships? So we jumped from that to creating a little scholarship course um, and launched it and uh, did a workshop. And we learned a ton from that experience. Whereas if we just talked about business and, and uh, business ideas, we probably wouldn't have learned as much. That's a brilliant example, Ni. Nee. Yeah, it almost seems like to grow your TE, you kind of have to SE too, like just do it, just do some projects, yeah. get stuff done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's an amazing TE hack that you also mentioned on Denzel's channel a few weeks ago too. You talked a little bit about how if you want to develop a skill, surround yourself with people who are already good at that thing or they're where you want to be at. So could you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, for about probably about 10 years, I felt like the, the best way to get good at something was to read a bunch of information about it and, um, and find other like-minded people who were also passionate about that subject as well. So for example, I was very interested in, since college, I um, was very interested in, in business and entrepreneurship. So uh, I would read a lot about business and investing and startups. And then I had a bunch of friends and we would spend all, we'd spend hours just like talking about ideas and business and so forth. But then somewhere around um, late twenties, the beginning crossing over to 30, uh, it dawned on me that really the fastest way to get good at anything is to focus more on the who instead of the what. So before I was so focused on the what, like, what do I need to know? What do I need to understand? What things, what skills do I need to develop? And what I realized is that it's actually much better to just spend time with people who are doing those things already. That the who is actually more powerful than the what. So if we start hanging out with people who are doing what we wanna do, we will naturally, we'll just naturally 
uh, cultivate the skills and instincts and, and worldview and perspective. And we'll move much, much faster towards our goal um, by hanging around people that are already in the position we want to be rather than just reading a bunch of books and information on it. So a lot of times, for example, I'll see somebody that might be interested in, like they want to start a business one day, right? They've got something they're passionate about and they've been thinking about starting a, a business or, or so forth. And so they'll read a ton of books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, The Millionaire Next Door, you know, all these different books on business. And they'll have friends that also want to start businesses and might, we might follow them for three years. And after three years, they're still talking about a business idea that they want to talk, you know, that they want to build. And they've actually not done anything just yet. So they don't know how to get to the destination. They're just talking about it. But if that person goes and says, let me go spend time with somebody who's sold a company and have a small little tribe of maybe four or five people that have sold a company before, right, or built a successful business, that individual will learn so much more from just those interactions, grabbing a cup of coffee, picking their brain, building a, a, a genuine and authentic relationship and connecting with them. They'll learn so much more about how to build a successful company and they'll move so much faster that, that way than reading a ton of books uh, and going to a ton of conferences and going to a ton of um, workshops and, um, and going online and reading everything that can be said on Forbes and Fortune Magazine about that topic. And so the, the simple idea is that who is, war, is far more powerful than what. And there's, a, there's an author named Jim Collins. He wrote a book called Good to Great, which is probably one of the best known business books um, on how successful companies are, are built. And he's got this idea that um, first who, then what. It's important for companies to focus on having the right people first and then to focus afterwards on what they want to build and so forth. And so I feel like there are a lot of places in life where this this principle uh, emerges that the, the who and the people are far more important than the things and the what. Yeah, brilliant advice, Ni. Nee. And so there's some SE in there too, where it's like, just get your hands dirty, you know, just get started, just make it happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is difficult though. Like just putting something out there is very challenging, right? There's all these, there are all these emotions that come up, fear of failure, fear of looking stupid, fear of like, what are people going to say? Uh, perfectionism, right? Or fear of being like exposed, um, fear of success. There are all these different, there are all these different like barriers and blockers that prevent us from putting things out there in the world. But that is the definition of creator, like a, or a creative is somebody, you know, that creates something, produces something. Um, and, and that's really where the learning happens. That's where that's where mastery begins to unfold is once we actually create something and we get feedback from the world. But it is very scary. And even for me, I can sometimes be a little nervous because I'm just like, you know, what are my friends going to think about about this idea? Or what if what if it gets criticized? Um, and so it's it's it might be simple intellectually, but emotionally, it's a difficult thing to do. That is too true. And so how do you overcome those emotional barriers to doing the thing? That's a great question. I would I would say probably like one of the one of the best ways to overcome those emotional barriers is to spend time with people who have already done that already. Because when we have conversations with them, what we realize is that the thing that seems like a big deal to us is really not a big deal to them at all. They've gone through that process many, many times before. Um, and so um, I'm just going to make up an example. Let's say that somebody wanted to be uh, an incredible sculptor. Uh, they had a passion for it. Maybe they took a couple of classes in college. And they're afraid of, the, and there's an art exhibit that's happening, a local art exhibit for, you know, um, rookie artists or novice artists that are getting started. That person, let's say his name is Tom. Tom might be really nervous about, you know, taking some of the work he's done and putting it out there to get feedback. But if he goes and spends some time with sculptors, right, who've been in tons of galleries before, they'll probably chuckle and laugh and tell stories to Tom of, yeah, I understand how you felt. I remember the first time I put together, um, you know, my first couple projects and I was terrified of putting it in an art gallery but by having that connection and conversation with somebody who's done it before, that person can help Tom realize that, oh, it's actually not maybe as scary as you think it is. And I'm here to support you and encourage you uh, and, and help you along the way because I've done it. And if I can do it, you can do it too. 
So I think having a support system makes a huge difference um, versus if we just try to do it alone by ourselves. Yeah, it seems so much bigger when you try to do it alone. But when you have other people kind of reassuring you that, you know, it's normal to feel these type of anxieties or fears, it makes you more confident. It teaches you that your experience is kind of universal and that there's reassurance in that because now you don't have to be so afraid because every or, you know, everyone else is afraid, too. So, you know, it's not an excuse anymore. So you just, you know, you, you close your eyes and you just put it out. <laughs> well said. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. And so, Ni, nee, how have you grown your introverted intuition, your NI, over the years? Over the years, I would say there have probably been a handful of things that have made a big impact on uh, NI. Uh, so, in December, I went to Savannah with a couple buddies, and we spent a week together reflecting on the year and uh, dreaming about what we want 2021 to look like. And this was my first time doing it with a group. Normally I would do an exercise like this by myself. And one of the downsides of doing it by myself is I tend to ask the same questions and they tend to be like very TE heavy of like, what are the outcomes for the next year? You know, what are the steps? And like, they tend to be very outcome uh, and externally oriented. And so I went on this retreat and um, two of the guys that were there, one was an INFJ a close friend and another was an ENFP. And so in this situation, um, we came, we all came up with different questions and we, and we collaborated to come up with the collective set of questions that we were going to ask and exercises we were going to do. And one of the exercises we did, this one caught me off guard and it ended up being the most powerful, perhaps the most powerful exercise we did while we were there. And it was an exercise where we pulled out our phones, we went to um, our photos app and we spent about 15 to 20 minutes scrolling through all the photos we took in the past year. And what we did is we selected in total about 15, maybe 20 photos each that, re that represented and reflected the most, the most meaningful times we had in, of the, in the past year. Um, things that just you know, were highlights of the year. And then once we collected all of our photos, we had a conversation and one of the key questions was, what were the common trends in the photos that we selected? Because that's gonna tell us a lot about what we value, what's important to us. And so I sat there and I went through and looked at all the photos I took in the last year. And it was so refreshing just to see like, wow, a lot of things have happened in the year. And there were a lot of photos and memories that came up, things I'd completely forgotten because you know, as intuitives, it can be easy uh, to be very future oriented. So it was really nice to, to have a little SI um, practice here and, and go in the past. And after looking at all the photos and sitting and looking at them, uh, a couple things emerged that were so blatantly clear, but I don't think I would have arrived at those conclusions on my own. Nearly all the photos that I selected had to do with um, spending quality time with people I care about, whether it was my wife, whether it was unstructured quality time with friends, like I had a photo for a couple photos, for example, a couple of buddies and, uh, um, and I, we went up to live here in Colorado. We went up to the, the mountains uh, and we went camping and I hadn't gone camping since sixth grade, sixth or seventh grade. And it was so nice to be immersed in nature, to not have a phone that's constantly buzzing, had no reception. Um, and so anyway, I had photos of like spending unstructured quality time with close friends. Um, I had photos that um, were, had to do with art. Uh, all that to say, it helped me to see very clearly the things that I value in life, right? Because how we spend our time, what, how we spend our money, where we devote our attention, all of those things are really strong tells of what is valuable to us, what's important to us. Uh, you know, if we ask most people, hey, what do you value? The things that they say they value are normally very different from the things that they actually value. And one of the best ways to identify the things that we value is not to ask ourselves, hmm, what do I value? And then write those down. It's actually to look at our money. How do we spend our money? How do we spend our time? And uh, another great example of this is looking at photos. Like, what are the things that uh, we took pictures of? Because the things that we took pictures of are usually a tell of things that are important to us. And so that was an incredibly helpful exercise that helped me to get more clarity on what are my values? What's important to me? Uh, and it helped me to forecast what 2021 is going to look like. And it caused me to recalibrate and 
and shift around some priorities because I started to realize, wow, the things that bring me the most joy in life may not necessarily be the things I would have immediately assumed. Uh, So I would say like that was an exercise that was immensely powerful uh, for not only developing FI, uh, but also using the, the, the findings or takeaways to, to forecast for the future. What we value is shown through our actions. Like you said, how we spend our money, what, what we actually use our time with. And that's a great way of tracking what are we prioritizing. And then once you know what you're prioritizing to then change it, if it's not something that really brings value into your life. It's a great type of reflection to look back at the things that gave you value and the highlights so that you can rec- recreate them. Yeah, that that's brilliant. Just looking in your photo reel to know what matters to you. Because oftentimes, if you're always like, go, 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 you don't really know what your FI really cares about. So really looking at like, oh, what, what mattered to me? It really helps you recenter yourself. Yeah, it's almost like your FI allows you to tap deeper into your NI. It's like every time you try, you get closer to what matters to you, you start to get closer to the future that you want to. Exactly. Yeah. Well said. Well said. It was a powerful experience. One of the things I walked away from um, when I when, when I was on the flight back from Savannah back to Denver, and I was you know in the airplane, and it was dark, and I was just like, which is great conditions for NI. Like, there's just not a lot of distractions. And what I realized is that. Uh, for a long time, I thought I wanted to build this huge company. Like, and then I wanted to be like the CEO of this, build a huge organization and all that stuff. And um, one of the, um, I was talking to one of my buddies who was, who was, um, who was also there, uh, the INFJ, and he's got a number of friends that have built very large, successful companies. And when I was talking to him and reflecting, what I realized is that the things that are important to me, spending quality time with um, in relationships, spending quality time with people I care about, having more unstructured free time to think and explore, um, spending time in nature, learning new things, traveling. Most of those things would be very difficult to do if I was running a large company, like a large um, successful company. I wouldn't be able to do most of those things at all. I'd be spending all my time on the business, especially if the company raised uh, investment capital, which was also something that I wanted. And what I realized is that this idea of building a company that was backed by investors was a story or narrative that um, I picked up, uh, and I thought that's what I want, you know, because I see, uh, you know, I look on the cover of Forbes magazine or Fortune or all these different magazines, and you see these people who look very successful, um, and I just thought to myself, unconsciously, that's what I want too. Uh, but going through this exercise. Uh, and getting to build more relationships with people who are different entrepreneurial, have different levels of entrepreneurial success, I walked away realizing that I want to build a company, um, but I want it to be much, much smaller than I expected before. Uh, what I realized is that uh, if it's too big, all the things that I took photos of, I wouldn't be able to do. Spending quality time with my wife, spending quality time with my friends, exploring hobbies, traveling, volunteering, none of those things. Um, or maybe I would say it would be very difficult to do most of those things. So uh, definitely an exercise that I recommend for anybody, especially in TJs, because our, our FI is in our back seat. So we're not very aware of the things that um, drive our value system. And this can be a really great way of externalizing it uh, so that we can look at it and, and assess. Fantastic advice, Ni. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> <laughs> And so what are some things you have done to improve your FI? So some activities that have helped accelerate FI growth for you. Something that my wife and I do, my wife is an INTJ. And so that's something that's actually very helpful is for developing an I is just being married to somebody who's an NI dom. Um, but one of the things that we do together is um, we journal. So I've, in fact, I've got my a journal here. And every morning, and another one, every morning, um, I'll wake up, and before I touch my phone, before I check email, I'll spend time journaling. And then it's also the last thing we do before going to bed. And there are a set of questions that we ask ourselves. Um, And there's also another journal. Let me see. Um, Highly recommend this. It's called the five-minute journal. Um, It's a really, really great. Basically, it's just got... um, a couple things that you fill out every day. 
Um, and so for example, you know, what are three things you're grateful for? What are three things that would make today great? Um, what are two daily affirmations? And so that's the, the morning part. And then at the end of the day, um, write down three amazing things that happened and what would have made today even better. And so we've got like, we'll answer that. And then also just like in the other journal, we'll just kind of write whatever is going on. And that's been incredibly powerful. I totally underestimated how much of an impact journaling would have on my life. I'm blown away by how much it's helped me um, to, I feel like uh, some of the goals and things that I've been thinking about are happening much faster than they were before. I have so much more clarity, but it helps, it helps me be able to, both of us, it helps us to be able to tap into FI. Because FI is in my backseat, it's not something I access very easily. But when I write down how I'm feeling or what's what's bothering me or what's going on, and I'm able to externalize it, it's a lot easier for me to be able to process it and see what's going on. And it's almost like having a conversation with myself uh, in some ways. Uh, and then writing things, writing down things that I'm grateful for, it just helps me to keep my perspective on the positive rather than on all the things that are not going well or that could could be going better. So that has been incredibly helpful, um, especially doing it uh, before as, as the first activity and last activity, because um, as soon as we wake up, our subconscious mind is like, our, our mind is very uh, impressionable right when we wake up and just before we go to bed. And so if we use that time to reflect and go in, we can, we can influence our subconscious mind a lot more than if we jump right into social media or checking you know st the stock price of a certain company or checking email so that's also been an activity that's been incredibly helpful uh not just for fi but also for ni in that it's helped to clarify the future vision right when we write things down our brains remember it more because now the experience is more kinesthetic uh, like pulling out a pencil and writing it down is a more kinesthetic so it brings in sc as well um and then all these new ideas start to emerge um, things that I may maybe like stewing on and consciously, I feel like the answer just suddenly appears as I'm journaling. And so that's also been a very helpful exercise for developing not just FI, but also NI as well. And it can seem as an ENTJ, like probably a lot of ENTJs or TE DOMs would look at journaling and think, it's a waste of time. It's a little woo woo. It's, you know, it's, it's slow, but um, oftentimes the best way to speed up is to slow down. That is amazing advice. Yeah. Because when you slow down, you can then center yourself on what matters and then you can then go back fast. You can go in a direction that is more suited towards your plants. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, mm -hmm. uh, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. There's a saying that you can go a long way, but you can go the wrong way. Or you can really like figure out where you want to go. So you, you head in the right direction on the offset. I mean, right away. So then you are able to go more quickly in the direction that is meaningful for you. Exactly. And it's a lot easier to iterate ideas on paper than it is to go into the real world and, and test them. Like to go in the real world and run in a certain direction only to figure out six months or one year later that, oh, that's not actually what I wanted. Sometimes journaling can help clarify those ideas um, so that we don't expend unnecessary energy in the real world going down a path that doesn't make sense. And if we would have just spent 30 minutes, 15 minutes, every day for a couple of weeks journaling, those realizations would have emerged much, much faster without expending all of that time, energy, resource, money uh, in the real world. Yeah, so that you can spend your energy on what serves your greater aims, your larger and I future that you want. Yeah, exactly. and so Ni, I'm wondering, what is your experience with SE and growing your SE? I would say that's an area of my life I'm, I'm growing in. Um, Two, two fronts. One is for a long time, I didn't pay much attention to what I ate. Um, and then um, the other one is physical fitness. Um, that's also something for a long time I didn't spend a lot of time investing in. Um, I was constantly on the go, go, go. But moving from my wife and I lived in Atlanta before we moved to Colorado. And one of the things that's been so great is everybody here in Colorado is so focused on the outdoors. Like we get like 300 days of sunshine and like everybody's spending time in the mountains, hiking, skiing, snowboarding, walking, swimming. And so it's made it a lot easier to get into SE and to spend 
quality time in the outdoors and just moving more instead of just sitting behind my laptop all day long. And so, um, so that's been very helpful. Um, also eating better. I've got some friends that really have that dialed in that understand nutrition and health very well. And so I've been learning from them and, um, I found for a long time, for example, um, I would skip breakfast or I wouldn't have a very good breakfast. I, cause I, again, I would wake up in the morning, check my email, check social media, and then immediately I start doing, and I think I'll, I'll eat later. Um, and I would also struggle to find what to eat if I did want to eat something for breakfast. And I found from, um, actually it was when I was in Savannah, um, the NFP that was there, he made a lot of smoothies and I asked him a lot of questions about smoothies. And I said, I, I really like these smoothies. Um, and it's packed with a ton of nutrition and it's not a long, there's not a whole, uh, long preparation process. And so from just hanging out with him, all of a sudden, I've been making smoothies nearly every day. There might be since, since, since January, there might be four or five days where I haven't had a smoothie. Um, and I would say before that I would probably have, you know, like read a lot of random articles online about eating healthy, but just spending time with somebody that was really healthy and had a strong point of view helped a lot. So, um, so the food part is getting better, but the physical activity quite isn't, isn't quite there yet. Um, in terms of like finding some kind of physical activity to do on a consistent basis beyond just like walking outside. Um, so, but I do find that whenever I am more active, um, I feel better, I can improvise better. Um, I can also think faster um, and I, I tend to just be in better spirits. So I think I still underestimate how much of an impact what food I eat and uh, how much that impacts my energy levels and my, uh, and my mood. Uh, and so that's still an area of growth for me. Amazingly said, as always, Ni. Nee. And so you're someone who is masterful at using the phrase, you are the sum of your five closest friends to your advantage. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're going to turn into the people you hang out with, then might as well surround yourself with people who have the level of health that you want who have the level of career goals that you want. Yeah, because it's gonna rub off on you. It's almost like people are contagious or infectious, like certain habits that people have are infectious. So if that's true, then to hang out with the people who infect you with goodness rather than <laughs> things exactly. that you don't want. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I would say it's the, I would say it's the highest leverage thing I, I can think of. Um, if not one of the highest leverage things is being very thoughtful about who we hang around because we will we will become exactly like them. Uh, and and the thing that's so interesting about it is the change happens so subtly that it's it our, our, we don't perceive it in the same way that like let's say that we were standing outside and we were looking at the moon and we just looked at the moon for ten minutes we wouldn't actually see the moon move. We we. Our, it, it, the 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 uh, the rate of change uh, isn't happening at a at a rate that's fast enough for our um, for our visual cortex to be able to see. Like we don't perceive the change, and yet the the the, the moon is moving very very quickly. I don't know how I I don't know the numbers, but it's moving much faster than most things on Earth. Uh, and it's the same thing too with the people we hang around. We're not going to actually see the way that they influence us most of the time. Um, it's like, uh, it's almost that whole metaphor of like the best way to, um, get rid of a frog is to boil it slowly and let the water just slowly get warmer and warmer and warmer until it boils, like until it boils. It's that same effect. Uh, and so we can either use that know-how to be intentional about the tribe we build and the relationships we have, or we can let those relationships just kind of happen haphazardly. And then those people will will influence us a lot more than we realize they do. Absolutely. We all have mirror neurons in our brain that mirror the people around us. So might as well use that in a way that's productive to our lives rather than destructive. It's, it's true that we have tiny imperceptible changes in our behavior due to the people we hang out with. And we should use these like tiny little changes in a way that's going to better us rather than in a way that's going to make us go in a direction we don't want to go down. Yeah, that is really good advice to be thoughtful with who you hang around. Yeah, because it's simple, but it's so, so true. And it, like there's so much gravity to that because 
if you are what you eat, then you are who you hang around with too. Cause that's like what your mind is eating. It's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's exactly, it's what we're consuming. We're going to be consuming their thoughts and ideas and perspective. Um, and all that is happening unconsciously to your point. Yeah. Yeah. So master your unconscious by hanging around people who are good for you. So true, Ni. And so I'm wondering, what are some spiritual revelations you've had that has helped catapult your growth? Yeah, I remember we had a conversation about this right now, like a, a month ago. Um, I would say, um, as someone who's a, a Christ follower, the most important thing in my life are people and relationships. Like when, it, when I sit down and think about it, loving my neighbor is the most important thing in life. Um, and, and so for me, being an ENTJ, one of the ways that I strive to do that is by using TE to help people um, make their lives easier or simpler. Um, but at the end of the day, when we die, we're not going to take anything with us. And I think it's so easy to get caught up in the status game or chasing money. Um, and I, when I have conversations with people that are, I've got one mentor, um, his name is Bill. I won't give too much information about him, but he's, uh, uh, he's in his seventies and he's lived a lot of life. Uh, very successful entrepreneur and investor and, um, very grounded individual. And it was, it's so fascinating to talk to people that are in their seventies because right? I'm in my early thirties. And so I'm just like, I feel like life uh, still, most of life is still ahead of me, but for somebody that's in their seventies, they're wrapping up their life. Like things are, things are wrapping up. And when I talk to, to Bill or other people that are, are in their 60s or 70s or approaching their 80s, their perspective on life is very different than the perspective of a young person. And what they often say is that they, they look back and they wish they would have spent more time with their, with, their, with their spouse or with their kids. They would have spent more time building relationships instead of chasing after status and success or money or prestige. And you know, for me, those things can be uh, those things can be temptations and distractions. Um, being an ENTJ, wanting to accomplish a lot, wanting to uh, have a lot of success, um, those things aren't inherently bad, but they can conflict with other values, like spending quality time with people we care about. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, I feel like we're all God's children, and we all deserve love and dignity and respect, regardless of how much money we make. Uh, what family we come from, where we live, what language we speak. Uh, and so I would say like that's that's a guiding star for me is how can I how can I love people? And by no means am I claiming that I'm perfect at it and that it's it comes easy. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a challenge and struggle, right? It's easier to love some people than it is other people. Um, but I feel like that is the most important thing in life. Um, and it and everything else comes from relationships. Everything else, um, uh, emerges from relationships. Even what we were talking about, about like, I think conventionally, it's easy to assume that the best way to learn something is just to consume a bunch of content about it. Um, whether it's buying courses, reading books, going to workshops and conferences. Um, but I found that it's actually spending time with people who are doing those things and having a genuine relationship that uh, one, not only do we end up learning the thing we want, but we also end up with a relationship and, and get a different perspective on life than we would have had otherwise. So I would say like that is, that to me, that is the most important thing. And so from like, a, uh, I said, sometimes people talk about how ENTJs are all about like resource and that like the most important resource for ENTJs might be like money or it might be, you know, it might be time or, or skills. But I think at the end of the day, it's the thing that matters most uh, is people. And if the people part is right, everything else will follow from there. That is absolutely, absolutely so true. Even what you were explaining at the beginning of the interview, what you were mentioning was the, a book and how it was saying that the who matters the most. You can figure out the what later, but the who is what's, what is the most paramount. And what you said right now, Ni, also reinforces that as well, where you're like, what it comes down, what life comes down to is the people the relationships that you're able to cultivate and the love you're, you're able to have between you, yeah, is the most important. Love is what everything comes back down to. It does, mm -hmm. it does. Yeah. I, 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 um, 
one way that, like if I were to give a report, if I were to come up with a report card to evaluate my life, it would be based on the metric of relationships. So I would, I would look at what does my relationship with God look like? What does my relationship with my wife look like? What does my relationship with my parents look like? What does my relationship with my sister look like? What is the relationship with my with my boss and coworkers? What are my relationships with my with my closest friends look like? What is my relationship with the poor and needy? What does my relationship look like with my actual next door neighbor? Our life, one way of organizing our life or thinking about our life is just a it's just a, a category of different relationships, um, and um, I probably don't I probably don't like consciously evaluate things as as much as I could in that regard, but I feel like that's a very helpful way of of measuring life is, you know, using TE metrics. It's not what's my net worth. It's not how much money am I making. It's not how fast is the business growing. It's not how big is how many how many um um how much square foot is the house or how it's none of those things. It's like what are the relationships and what are the qualities, how healthy or unhealthy are those relationships? And that's, um, that's the, that's the metric that matters. Uh, there's this, there are a number of, of, um, um, thought leaders and entrepreneurs that talk about how, um, essentially we make whatever we measure. So whatever it is that we measure, that's what we'll end up making. That's the thing that will naturally be most important to us. So, um, I feel like that, orienting life around relationships and thinking about it from a relational standpoint is a may not be it's actually not the only way to think about it but i found that it's it's been the most helpful way to think about it um if my goal is to love people that is amazing yeah one of the things that life can come down to is like how well have you loved other people in your life and how well have you loved what matters mm -hmm. yeah and that is such a good point about like what you measure gets managed. So yep. if you're not measuring love or you're not measuring your relationships, then it can very easily take the back burner. It can take a secondary priority. And so it's important to pay attention to what you're measuring. And people tend to measure numbers because it's more easy to measure numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But for some, for stuff that's harder to quantify, sometimes it slips people because it's harder to really to really measure it. So sometimes people forget about it, but it's so important to remember the importance of relationship building and remember the importance of really taking care of the souls around you for lack of a better word. <laughs> yeah, you're hundred yeah. percent right. Yeah. yeah. Those things are, at least from this perspective, and it sounds like you have a similar perspective, that relationships are the most important thing. Um, and it's also interesting because they're, it's, it's hard, it's much harder to, to measure a relationship or to impose a, a TE metric. Um, I feel it's paradoxical um, and ironic that the most important things in life are immeasurable um, or the current instruments we have to measure them aren't very good. It's a lot easier to your point to measure net worth, for example, but it's a lot harder to measure the quality of our relationship with someone. Uh, but I hope that as um, as our culture it grows and progresses, we'll be able to have more tools to to create metrics to evaluate some of those intangibles because I genuinely believe the intangibles are far more important than the than the tangibles. The immaterial is far more important than the material. I hard agree with that. Yeah. It's like nourishment for your soul to to invest into your relationships. But because we're not really told to like take care of our I know it sounds woo woo, but our soul, mm -hmm. uh, then we also don't measure it because we're not used to being told to focus on those type of things too. But it's almost like the relationships in our lives, they provide us with mental nourishment, emotional nourishment, intellectual nourishment, and depending on your view, eternal nourishment too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're social creatures. We were designed to be social and we do our best when we're in relationships with others and collaborating. Like anything in life, any, and really almost anything, I would, I would make the case that anything in life that we've created as humans that's valuable required at least two or more people. Whether it's cities, I mean, cities are incredibly valuable to uh, having a large group of people live in a similar space and be able to exchange goods and services and um, protect each other and connect. Like 
cities cities are the result of people coming together. Um, anything anything that's been created in the world, like the, the chair that I'm sitting on, was the result of a group of people coming together, designing the chair, and then using different skills and talent to actually build the chair. And then somebody built the website, and then you know, like everything that's valuable in this life is a result of collaboration. And that collaboration can only happen if those relationships are there. And it feels ironic too. It was like uh, when I was flying back from Savannah to Denver, and I was thinking about how for so long I thought what I wanted out of life was to build this huge company. And I realized that, you know, on some level, I assumed that having a huge company would give me the flexibility to spend time with people. But ironically, it actually would repel me from those very same people that I want to spend time with. And so I feel like on some level, we all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. Uh, we, all, we all want connection. Uh, but it seems like some of the strategies that our, our society encourages us to take actually pushes us away from the people, the very people we want to we want to have relationships with. And so we end up chasing status as a, as a, we think that if we have status or if we make enough money or if we, you know, if we're funny enough or if we're likable enough or if we're attractive enough or if we're smart enough, then people will love us and like us and want to spend time with us. Um, so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's very interesting how life works. Still learning. I mean, we're all still, I, I didn't mean that as, as in to say like, oh, I've got it all figured out, but it's just interesting to to see how life unfolds and to see all these little paradoxes. That's absolutely true. Yeah. We're taught roundabout ways to get connection instead of directly going and getting connection at the source, which is other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The highest leverage thing, like you said, Ni, is to cultivate long lasting relationships that mean something. Yeah. Because like you said, we're social creatures and there are a lot of studies done on happiness and about how one of the biggest factors of what makes a person happy is their relationships. Yeah. A lot of the things we do is like a roundabout way to get the relationships that we want. So I love that message of collaboration about how it's important to collaborate with others like, like this, this, there's a beauty to this too, because like Carl Jung says, when you have the meeting of two different chemicals, a new substance is made. So every time, people get together and make something together. They make something kind of irreplaceable together. And all the irreplaceable moments in life or all of the irreplaceable relationships or irreplaceable experiences are with other people. 100%, yeah. you're right. And anything you'd like to leave the audience off with, Ni? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you again for inviting me on your show and for all the work you're doing to help people cultivate their empathy. I think that's uh, I think that's really powerful and it's cool to see that you're creating collaborations, whether it's this conversation or other conversations you've had with people of different types or the times when you brought several different people that are the same type together to facilitate a conversation. I think that's that's powerful. And at the end of the day, like when we when we're on our deathbed and we're you know like hopefully it's not gonna be like terrible and painful but you know if we're on, when we're on our deathbed we're not going to think about especially to the you know ENTJs we're not going to think about oh man I wish I had another 1.2 million on that net worth or man I wish my salary when I was 45 was $20,000 more or I wish I would have had a certain car or you know like none of that will matter um, the thing that we will remember is the relationships we had um, and we're going to think about the mem the positive memories we had with people. And we're also going to think about the times where we maybe didn't treat people the way we could have or should have. We, maybe we didn't express so much, as much gratitude or, or love. And so I feel like for a lot of um, anti-Js, the, the drive to create and accomplish and get things done can be, not in all cases, but it, it feels like it can often be, uh, to your point, like what you said before, an indirect path to getting love and acceptance and that I knew for me one probably one of the biggest takeaways I got from um, my wife and I worked with a therapist probably about four years ago and it was it was incredible um, to go into FI and, and I and um, there's so many scripts that were, were given as, as children from our from our society and culture that we just accept as the truth 
and we run off and we end up living out that script. And I would say probably one of the biggest takeaways I got from um, from my sessions, my um, therapist was an INFJ, so she was very helpful. Her NIFE was just like incredible unpacking things. But it was that I felt like I was a human doing instead of a human being. And so I felt like unconsciously, the only way that I'll get acceptance or love um, um, or encouragement from people is if I continue to do, I must continue to produce. I must, I must establish my value. I must communicate my value. I must demonstrate my value because if I don't, I will get voted off the island. Um, and so like ch changing that frame from, I'm not a human doing, I'm a human being. And to your point, like the product is my soul. Right, so how do you know how do I cultivate a, a rich soul and and help others do the same thing too? Like that's ultimately what we are. Um, and so I think to 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 anybody that's listening, especially to ANTJs, we're not human doings. We're human beings. We're not a machine. We're we're beings. Um, and hopefully that that can create some sense of peace um, that we don't have to perform and check everything off the box um, so that we gain validation and approval. Um, so hopefully that that helps. Joyce, thank you again for uh, inviting me on. I'm, I'm very grateful and I think what you're working on is very cool and very neat and very grassrootsy and that's, that's very cool and collaborative. Thank you for all of your encouragement and just your amazing giving spirit. Thank you, Ni, for all of this amazing advice on how to really cultivate and grow your soul because that's what's important. You, you cannot see it but it gets sub subtly influenced throughout our our life. And it's good good to keep a pulse on our soul and try to feed things that enrich it instead of things that detract from it. I love your ability to prioritize what matters, which is people and the words of wisdom you leave people off with. You've really been developing your NI. Your NI is great at knowing what is ultimately rewarding in the future. Yeah, so thank you for that. And thank you for telling us about the value of double checking what we're consuming. Yeah. And what we're consuming into our mind, whether it's the people we hang out with or the things that we do, they really affect us on a, on a very core level. Yeah. And so thank you for hitting home what matters, <laughs> which is people. Everything comes down to people and love. Yeah. Well yeah. said. <laughs> yeah so thank you for the very meaningful messages you make sure you get across you referenced the deathbed and that's really puts everything in life in perspective thinking about your deathbed because ultimately that's inevitable for everyone yeah it's hard to swallow but it's important too because if you live your life considering you're going to die one day it'll allow you to really orient yourself towards the things that matter rather than towards the things that seem most important right now, but don't matter in the long run. So it's almost like the deathbed is a great mental exercise to know if you're living your life in accordance to what you would be okay with or proud of during your last moments. Yeah, I love that perspective that and I, you shed for all of us. <laughs> Thank you, thanks. This is yeah. great. Thanks for coming on. See ya. <laughs>